Y'all sound amazing. You can be seated. Nice little guitar at the end there. That was nice. A little... No, I'm not coming to do anything music-wise, but let's give it up for the worship team. That was awesome. Delhi. <laughs> Got J. Joe Sway in the building somewhere around here. All right, cool, cool. So I got to do, always got to do a couple shout outs. It's good to see you guys uh, this Sunday morning. As you know, we've been going through this series on agape. And it's a little play on words here. I got me, all right. That's not, it's not what we want, right. That's a knockoff brand. And we're going to talk about how uh, our obsession with self sometimes can get in the way of real love uh, that we're trying to have. So it's been an awesome couple weeks as a church. We've had, uh, you know, the series on Agape has been great. There's all these gr- awesome things happening. We have financial peace, Women's Day is coming up, and singles barbecues is awesome. A lot of great things are happening. We had an amazing Easter service, and uh, the single service was amazing. Uh, so many great parts of the single service. So uh, it was an incredible time. And now we're coming back around, right, to being anchored in our Agape love, right? We're coming back around to that. Because loving God, loving others, it truly does anchor us. It can help us to really feel grounded. It can help us to understand, all right, I'm a Christian. Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, who am I supposed to be as a Christian? It seems like there's a lot here in the New Testament. i got to kind of figure this out. And so it's kind of like when in doubt, right, you got to come back to your anchor. you got to come back to, to the security. And this is our love. It's our agape for one another. And... Um, Just to recap a little bit, you know, this is our working definition, and and agape is truly a word that is defined by Jesus. Jesus has defined the word agape, unconditional and selfless commitment to another's internalization of the love of God. We want to selfless, be selfless in our, our help and our assistance of other people experiencing the love of God. Now, as we've been talking about, sometimes we can try to do that, and it's not perceived that way. Sometimes we can look to help somebody experience God in a way that maybe the world doesn't always show love. And it could be like, wait, that doesn't feel like love, right? And just because something doesn't feel like love doesn't necessarily mean it's not. It might not be, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not love, right? And so if you're wondering, okay, well, what is this agape love? The, real, the most simplistic way to answer it is look at the cross, like, that is, that, that is what defines agape love. Look at Jesus. Look at the story of the cross, why he went to the cross. And you have your answer. It says, for God so loved. There it is. Then he loves it. Agape. For God so loved. That's the verb of agape. So for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's agape. God sent Jesus to die for us. Right, so if you're going to die, right, for somebody, by nature, self is not involved, right? Because the moment you're thinking about self when it comes to sacrifice, it's, it's going to be incompatible. Because sacrifice is really devoid of self in a lot of ways. Like a truly selfless act. Like with nothing expected on the other side. Like that's... That's different. That's challenging. And as I've been studying this out and going through this, I'm like, man, I have, I have a lot of room to grow, you know, in this. This is a very high calling. Like to act in a way that is like entirely selfless. Like nothing. Like even, even in church, you know, you serve, could look good. But like, are you kind of like low-key, high-key expecting something in return? You know, even if it's even as small as like, hey, good job. It's not wrong that you're, we're encouraged by those things. And indeed, I think we should encourage one another, right? But how, how do you feel when it doesn't happen? That might reveal that there was a little bit of self involved, right? And so as you can see, this is a really high bar. And it's one that we're going to be striving toward. And we're going to fall flat on our faces sometimes. We're not going to do this right and we're just going to mess up. But like, we can help each other get there. And we can do this together. So why are we going through uh, this series? Once again, it's coming back to being anchored. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. 
So once again, not knowing what to do, there's a lot in the Bible. Where do I start? Well, we start here. We start with loving God and loving people. And what's interesting is Jesus takes this even a step further. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40, he says, a new command I give you, love one another. But he doesn't say love someone else as you love yourself. He says, love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So what sets the church apart from everything? What is the contrast that we as a church are supposed to represent to the world? Well, people are like, well, why do I need to go to church? And what's the difference? And it's all the same. Everybody's just jacked up everywhere you go, you know. And, and how is it obvious? How is it obvious that, that, that we're a church? Well, it's by our love for one another. It's by this agape standard, right? This is how we are set apart from the world. Because it is rare, right? Like selfless commitment to each other's, like feeling the love of God. Man, I know many of us just wake up and it's like, man, I'm trying to feel the love of God today. <laughs> Let alone like sacrifice to help someone else feel the love of God, right? Like it, it's, it's challenging because we're constantly kind of, it can be thinking about ourselves a lot. Right? Like, what are my needs? What do I want? What are some things that I feel like are going to help me? This is kind of the, the, the world that we live in. And, um, you know, our love, it's got to be the most recognizable thing about us. Like, like, you, like we talked about branding. Like, you're wearing that Adidas brand and those three stripes. You know, when people see it from far away and they're like, okay, that's Adidas. Right? That's Adidas. And so our love, it's got to be that obvious. We want it to be that obvious. Right? But as we know, that's hard sometimes. Right? It's hard. It's hard to love. It's easy to, sometimes it can be easier to love somebody you don't really know that well. Right? But it's sometimes in your own home where it can be hardest to love. Right? Sometimes in your own community when it can be the hardest to love. Right? So, so this is why we have God and we have first and foremost our connection with him. This is going to give us the strength to continue to love imperfect people in a way that he loved us. That he loved me and you. Because we all are imperfect. Just going through this here. We went through what is agape. We talked about agape brand. We talked about in house church our debt to love. Now we're going to talk a little bit about this idea of knockoff love. So, all right, maybe this is a test for teens. Can you, can you tell which ones are the knockoff? All right, can you tell which ones? If you think they're the brown, if you think brown is the knockoff, raise your hand. All right, if you think the black ones are the knockoff, raise your hand. All right. Boom, there you go, all right. This is the Yeezy brand, by the way. These, these, these look like they got them recycled somewhere, and, and now they cost $500. So there you go. Like, I wish I could market that well. Uh, but but they, they, they figured that out. This is like, I've seen so many, come on, ladies. I've seen, you've had one of these knockoffs, right? Louis Vuitton knockoffs are like the number one, not, Lolly, don't lie. Come on, you might have had one. <laughs> Someone, no, I'm just joking, I'm just joking. Lolly is only, only the real deal, right? And that's what today is about. Like, we want to be about the real deal, the authentic thing, the real agape love, not the fake Louis bags, right? Pretty sure there's music, there's songs about these things. All right, some of y'all don't even want to, you know, acknowledge that, but that's okay. All right. So there's different brands, and I was just kind of playing around with this. Like, what's your brand? When people look at you from far away, what do you want them to see? We got, you want them to see success? I'm successful. I made it in this society. Look at me. Um, I've, did, I've done something. Then we got religious. Oh, I'm a you know, church goer. I carry my Bible around. Da, da, da. Like, what do you want them to see? Then we got me. What did I put under there? Looking out for number one. There you go. That's the motto of, of the me brand. Looking out for number one. Strong power. Look good. Feel good. Or, you know, you see like on Instagram, this is like, oh, man, this is how you get this. And then you have... You have guys that go on these crazy diets, and then it comes out later they're on steroids. And it's just all, it's all fake, right? It's all crazy. Who is that? Um, Liver King, right? So he, so he built this whole empire on this idea of if you have this particular diet, you will be ripped and jacked. And then later on it comes out he was steroids the whole time. So, you know, it's like that's the, that's the danger of knockoff brands, right? That's the danger. It's like you got to keep living up to this brand, <laughs> Right, you got to, the pressure stays on you to keep up with the appearance. Look at me, I'm a success. Look at me, I'm pretty religious. I'm a good Christian. 
look at me. Look at this health and wealth lifestyle that I have, right? Or just look at me. Uh, you know, <laughs> I think you should look at me, so just do it, all right? So we're going to talk today, and here's the big four in the Bible. You have love of the world. These are, these are the most common knockoff brands, and these are the ones that are preached against. You have love of the world, love of money, love of darkness, love of self. These are the competing brands. And there's a lot of people that, that the counterfeit industry for, for brands is, like, very lucrative. They do a really good job making things look similar. And so that's why you have specialists that are actually able to, like, go and they'll look. They know the stitching. They know what the sole is supposed to look like, like if we're talking shoes. They just, they know exactly what, even they know the imperfections of the real one. So, so if the fake has fixed the imperfection, they know it's fake. It's weird. So, so they just know it, right? And so some of these, it's, it's interesting because some of these can actually look like love in a certain way. Like, like, you know, if you think about it, you know, if you think about having money or whatever, right? But let's say you love money, but to mask this love of money, you give a lot, right? Now, that, that doesn't mean everybody that has a lot of money in giving loves money, but I'm just saying it could be a potential unhealthy manifestation, right? You know, love of darkness. So you like being to yourself, right? This can, so you're like more quiet. You, you build high walls with people and no one really knows you. And that might be like, oh, they're nice. They don't hurt anybody. But they're not deep with anybody either, right? So some of these things can actually kind of replicate love. Right, and this is it's interesting. So we're gonna we're gonna dive into this. But so far, so far, so good. We're, we're in this together. All right, cool. So we have to declare war on these things. All right, they are not gonna go down without a fight. Your the love of the world, love of money, the love of darkness, the love of self. It's not gonna go down without a fight. You have to decide that I'm going to fight this. Otherwise, it will t- it will take over at some point. If you don't understand that this is the war for your soul, right, to live a life of ascribing to the world principles, of of going after success and money, of living in the darkness, don't be open with anybody. Don't have deep relationships with anybody. Or the love of self, right? If you don't think of it as this is a battle for my soul, you're going to lose. It's like imagine walking on some battlefield or even any sporting event and you're like, oh, I just came here to hang out. Meanwhile, someone's trying to dunk on you. Right? It's like if you go out on the basketball court and a bunch of guys are playing a serious game, and you're just like, doo, 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 you know, and they just get dunked on. It's because you didn't understand that this was a game. This was actually, they were playing hard. All right? They were, they were looking for that. And then you end up on YouTube, and, you know, it's all embarrassing after that. But <laughs> we don't want, Satan tries to embarrass us like this. Right? We're just getting dunked on. Right? Because we don't understand. We don't understand that this is what's happening. We think that, like, we weave God into some of this stuff. We'll try to say, oh, yeah, yeah, God's a part of this and God's a part of that. And this is your health and wealth, prosperity kind of gospel situations where, you know, follow God and you will be rich. And plant, sow this seed and give this money and this will uh, multiply ten times. It's like, I don't know what scripture, I don't know. That's like, a, it's somewhere in there, right? But it's definitely not the standard that Jesus set, all right? And so you have these weird kind of combos, of loving one of these things and, like, love of God, and you can see the way some of those manifest. You can't do it. They can't be, they have nothing in common, zero in common with the love of God. The love of the world, love of money, love of darkness, love of self has nothing in common with the love of God. All right? So if you're trying to blend them, one's going to win. One's going to win. All right? And, and you know what's at stake is your relationship with God. Like the thing that's going to give you and me peace, the thing that's going to give us joy, the thing that's going to make us feel safe, right? That's what's at stake. That's what's at stake when we lose this battle. And we're going to talk today about the love of self. This is the, we don't want to be about a got me, right? That's the knockoff, a got me. No, 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 we're not going to do it. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, it says, but mark this, there will be terrible times In the last days, people will be lovers of themselves. And guess what? After that, it goes into lovers of money, which we talked about, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good. And so you say, treacherous, rash, conceited, and you say to yourself, wow, like, 
all those things have something in common with being a lover of yourself? Like, you know, in today's world, actually love yourself. Like, this is not a, a negative thing at all, right? And I get it. Like, I get the self-esteem battle. Like, I understand that. As somebody who's dealt with low self-esteem, depression, all those things, like, I, I get that, right? I don't think the answer to higher self-esteem is this concept of self-love. I think the answer to building confidence is embracing God's love, right? Like when you know you're loved by the, the one that created it all, that's a different feeling than saying, I, as one person, love myself. I've created limited things, but I do love me, right? That's not as deep and as powerful and as secure life-giving of a, of a, of a thought as understanding that the one that created the entire universe loves you. So the battle for your self-esteem to feel confident is to internalize that truth. It's not about, that's also, this is weird, it's not about how you feel. It's the truth that God loves you. So it's just more about do I accept that, that reality. It's like if I said to you the sky is blue, like what do you have to gain by saying no, it's purple? Because it's two things, like you're wrong and why are we fighting, right? It's like God's just like, no, I love you. Why fight that? Why argue against that? Makes no sense, right? And yet we do it. God, how can you love me? How can you love me? Like, what is it? Like, I created the universe. If I say I love you, I love you. Why are we debating this situation? What more can I do than send my son to die for you to prove that point? Right? So, so God loves us. So being a lover of, the, of self, and I'll break this down a little bit, maybe in terms of our terms. So phylos, we've talked about friendship, love. That's where this word comes from, the, the Greek translation for love of self. Autos, right? So it's like automatic, it does itself. So this is self-loving, selfish, being fond of self, describing someone preoccupied with their own selfish desires, self-interest. Uh, and I think you can think of somebody as being self-absorbed, selfish, self-centered. There's the Greek myth of, uh, I think it's a narcissist. It just basically kept looking at himself to the point where he fell in the water and drowned, right? Like, like this is, this is uh, you know, it hurts. It's destructive to love yourself. It's destructive to the people around you when we're obsessed with self. But yet it's so hard and so insidious, right? Like sometimes you don't even know when it's happening. Like when the love of self has crept back in because it feels very much like I'm supposed to think this way and feel this way, right? It can, it can, it can feel like that. And so... Uh, here's, here's a passage here. This is being, you know, being self-centered, it hurts others. This is an amazing passage in James chapter 4, verse 1 through 2. What causes, if you want to know what causes fights and quarrels, here's the answer. All right, what causes fights and quarrels anywhere? All right, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel. And you fight. Here's the deal. You do not have because you do not ask God. And then it talks about asking God with the right motives. And so here we go. The cause of every single quarrel in the world is rooted in wanting to get your way. It's rooted in self. It's rooted in I want to get my way. And you said no. And I have a problem with that. My ego has a problem with you saying no to me. How dare you say no to me. You know how special I am. You know how awesome I am. You know how much I've done. And you're going to say no? Ego, ego doesn't like that. Does not like that. And then we fight. And then we get mad. And we become petty. And we distance ourselves. Right? And then all this sin just starts shaking out. Right? When we're thinking about ourselves. We cannot love our neighbor the way Jesus loved us while we are self-absorbed. You, we will not be able to love people the way Jesus loved us why, while we are self-absorbed, while we are thinking about our own interests. And then, you, and then this is where the temptation comes in. But wait, but who's going to take care of this, this thing that i got to do? Who's going to take care of this? What does the scripture say? You do not have because you do not ask God. It's your relationship with God takes care of you while you're able to take care of others. And that takes faith. That takes real faith. Real faith, enough to say, I'm not going to worry about me. I'm going to let God worry about me. I'm going to worry about you. I'm going to concern myself with your well-being, right? You know, right now uh, we have a four-year-old, and we're trying to help him understand the word no. And, man, this is tough. This is tough because, because we're also teaching him to say, like, 
you know, please and thank you and all these things, right? So right now he's on this kind of thing where if he's, he believes if he says please, it's like an automatic. And I'm like, did we, this is our fault? Like, I thought we were supposed to teach him to say please. And, and so at first when they're saying please, you're like, okay, cool. He said please, like, here you go. And now, you know, we've, we've driven out one problem to, to arrive at another, right? Which is now he thinks like, oh, I want that knife, please. No. But wait, I said please. And I can kind of be a little curt, like, nah, I don't care. The answer's no, buddy. <laughs> you know? And then he, you know, throws his little, he throws a little fit. So he stops, you know. And then he could go into his room and, you know, like he needs time. He's already like a teenager. I don't know what's happening. Um, but he's not good with no. Right? He's not good. It's just, and it's a lot more visible. But, what am I about to say? But some of us are also not good with no. Right? Some of us throw little tantrums too. We just know how to cover it up. We just know how to hide it a little bit better than my four-year-old son. Right? Do we? That's a good question. Or sometimes it's obvious as well. Right? And uh, it's, here's my opinion. Who you are when you don't get what you want says more about your character than just about anything else. Who are you when the answer is no? Who do you become when the answer is no? It's hard. It's hard to deal with no, especially if we think we're the center of the world or the center of attention. It's really hard to hear no at that point. I remember this was like eight years ago. I wanted to start this ministry. Um, this was, uh, we were living in Baltimore at the time. We wanted to start this ministry. And, um, and I put together, I did all this homework, and I put together this game plan. I'm, and I was like, I'm going to go present this idea. And, of course, it's going to be, it's going to be yes. Because look at all this homework I did. Look at my heart. I want to help. I want to serve. Right? And so I go and I present this idea. And uh, I was kind of given what felt like the runaround. And uh, basically it was kind of a no. Right? Without kind of trying to, without saying no. All right? It was a no. And I got the message. Uh, I left discouraged, obviously. Because, uh, you know, I was like, had my hopes up. And here's the deal, though. Was I really selfless? Because I felt a lot of anger after. So what was I expecting? Right? Like, I wanted a yes. Like, my, my service was dependent on a yes. Like, my love, especially for that brother that I felt like said no, was conditional based on whether or not he said yes to me. <laughs> That's selfish. That's self-centered. Because I, be, I can be upset, you know, I can grieve the no, but why would my love for this person change if I'm supposed to be willing to go to the cross for somebody like Jesus did for me? Right? So what did I do? I didn't stop, you know, serving. I kept serving God. Um, but I avoided this brother. I'll be honest. I, I, I gave, like, wide birth to him in the fellowship. You know, I found, you know, I, I didn't want to, like, find myself in some weird thing. And then, you know, I was like, I'm not, I'm not asking anything ever again. Nothing. I'm not asking anything. I'm going to do me over here. Give me my little, like, little, you know, whatever Bible talk situation. And I'll just go there. And I pulled my heart back. I pulled my heart back from this brother, all right. And, and it hurt. It hurt me. Because every time I would see him, I was like, why, why do I have these weird thoughts? I'm like, I'm supposed to be loving. And this doesn't, I don't feel like love right now. I don't feel like this is love for this, for this person. He's done nothing wrong other than say no. He has a right to say no, right? Like not everybody has to do everything we want, Right? Okay, so why am I all of a sudden treating him this way? And, and, and that was God really helping me. And I'm st I still got to work on this because I have ideas like si six million ideas a week. I stress people out all the time. All right, no one more than my wife, Lamisha, who has to sit there and I'll just pop up out of the couch. Babe, like we got to do this. And then next thing you know, she's on some adventure doing some new project. Right, and so some of us are like that. There's a lot of dreamers in here. Right? So it's really hard. It's hard. It can be tough to hear no when you're a dreamer, right? But if it's God's will, you'll be all right. If you've asked God, it'll work out. You don't give up on it if it's really a vision, if it's really a dream. You'll keep navigating through the punches, through the hard times. You'll keep navigating if it's really God. 
I let my love for self get in the way of my love for God, and in that situation, my love for another brother. So I just want to, I want to break, I'm going to break this down just a little bit, just to, if it's not proven yet, I want to show you or demonstrate to you why and how our love of self is destructive to ourselves and to others. But also to repent of a love for self is your freedom and your healing. Right? I'm not just up here to say, you're selfish, change. No, no, no. Like I want you, I want us all to understand that as you repent of this, you actually feel a lot better. All right? You actually feel a lot more peace. And I want to break this down. So here we go. Here we go. Boom. Here, here's four manifestations of, of a love of self. Insecurity, fear, bullying, self-righteousness. Okay? I'm going to break these down quickly for you guys. And I'll put some notes on the app. All right? So think about this. If you're loving yourself a lot, if you think about you, right, you're going to have thoughts like this. Do they like me? Do they respect me? Like, I could be like this. I'm like, I'll say a bunch of dumb things in a conversation. As I, you know, as you guys can probably see, I talk a lot. So then next thing you know, they leave and I'm asking my wife, like, oh, man, did I, did I do anything dumb there? She'll be like, no, 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 you're good. Okay, like, amen. All right, cool. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, I, you know, and it's, and it's, and so, but I, but I think about that because I'm thinking about me. I'm thinking about how do you, how do they think about me, right? All right. So insecure people, when you're struggling with this, or let's not, let's not put anybody in a box, right? You're battling insecurity. You're going to experience a boost to your ego through others thinking well of you. So the battle for you becomes to get, how do I get as many people to think well of me as possible? Right? And that becomes your aim and your goal. How do I get a lot of people to think highly of me? And people that struggle with insecurity will often make you feel bad for not making them feel good. All right? When you don't make them feel good, they'll make you feel bad. Because they're the, the idol, the, the God of that moment is self. And if you don't cater to their image of self, if you don't cater to that, if you don't act in compliance with that, they'll hurt you for it. You know, and it comes in many ways, right? It's like subtle. It can be a lot of different things. So this is why this is destructive for two reasons. One, if you struggle with insecurity, we know that is not a good feeling. We, anybody, I battle insecurity, I hate it. I hate that feeling of someone leaves and I'm like, oh, what did I do, right? It's a weird feeling. Like you feel like I'm in trouble, <laughs> you know. And then secondly, how it affects how we treat other people, right? right? If we think we're the God of our world, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be weird when people don't also see that. Your, you know, your Bible example of this is Saul, right? He's like, they, they said David slayed tens of thousands and I've only slayed thousands. And then what does it say? He said he kept a jealous eye on David after that, right? right? And, uh, but... The consequences of that were, were bad for Saul. They're also bad for the entire Israelite nation. Set them back years, years because of one man's selfishness. The second thing, when you love yourself over God, you will be fearful. You will be fearful, right, because you're thinking about self-preservation a lot. Right, you think about self, okay, protect me. I don't want to get my feelings hurt. I'm, I'm fragile, uh, blah, blah, blah. God won't protect me. I need to protect myself. Nobody's ever done it for me. I need to do it for myself, right? It's that kind of thinking. Another thing I can struggle with, okay? All right, this is the I have to take action. If I don't, who will? You know, it needs to, it needs to look like this. I got to fix this situation, right? We're running around fearful. We're running around scared, all right? Trying to make everything better because no one else will. You know, this looks like anxiety. Uh, it could be frantic. This is also when we're fearful, we can tend and lean towards being controlling. So imagine if you're in a relationship, you're worried they're, they're getting ready to leave and exit the relationship. You control more, right? We see this. This is toxic, right? You try to control the relationship more to, 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 to make them not leave, right? And this can get really ugly and really bad. So fearful people experience a boost to their ego through control. When you're able to control the situation around you, you feel like fear goes down, right? This is the fight for safety at all costs, even if it means pushing everybody away. 
high, uh, when you struggle with this, you can be highly selective about who you let in and how you act and look to control your environment, right? It's like the proverb, you building up high walls invites destruction, right? You don't realize how much it is, is harm is being done to yourself in the loneliness island that you're cultivating, right? And it just can feel so isolating there. And then we're mad because no one is, is, is taking the boat over to loneliness island with us, right? You know, I'm just, I'm by myself. Nobody cares. Well, you, like, built a whole castle on Loneliness Island. Like, I want to go, but you have archers shooting me every time I take my boat over to Loneliness Island. Can maybe you leave Loneliness Island? Is that okay? I'll send a boat, right? I'll have them come. You know, we give you everything you need. You got a meal over here, you know. It's going to be awesome, all right? The archetype for fear, you know, Pharaoh uh, he felt threatened, so he tried to control everything. Who knows what, Pharaoh, what would have happened with Pharaoh if he was willing to let the Israelites go first time. God might have blessed his whole life, you know, after that. God does bless Gentiles that help his people, that help his children. He does that, right? But Pharaoh and his self-centeredness cost them a lot. All right, you read about the plagues, they lost a lot. All right, that was not, it was not a good administration, okay? So... All right, here's another thing. When you love yourself over God, this is a tough one. You'll become a bully. What's interesting, a lot of us that have felt bullied, there's this interesting vicious cycle between being, a, being bullied and becoming one. And you don't even know it when it's happening sometimes. Because all you know is I don't ever want to feel that way again. I've been hurt. I don't ever, I'm not going to ever feel that way again. If you listen to any Mike Tyson interviews, one of the best boxers of all time, you say, why do you have this much, when you come into the ring, this much energy, this much, you know, you want to you get this guy out of here. And he talks about how much he was bullied as a kid. And he says, I'll never let anybody make me feel that way again. And so what happened was the bullied became the bullier, right? He's like, I'm going to be tough. I can identify a lot with that story as well. You know, and, and, a, and this is the thing, like bullies... They experience a boost to their ego when they have other people around them that are hurt like them and feel hurt the way they do. So when we don't deal with our pain, it will deal with us and we'll deal with other people. You know, and this can be prevalent in church hurt a lot. I'm just going to be honest. If we haven't healed from church hurt, then a lot of times we can want others to also be hurt like how we're hurt. And we can convince them that they should be hurt like how we're hurt. We want others to feel the pain that we feel. And this is this cycle between the one that's hurt and the one that's doing the hurting. And as, you're, as we're sharing and as we're saying these things, we're actually getting more people like vi vicariously hurt as well through our own experience. Parents have to be careful of this with their kids, right? Because you guys know, you, you know, your parents have been around for a while. You're bound to run into some, you know, bad situation if you're living on this earth for long enough. And then the parent goes, you know, mom or dad go home, and they talk about all this hurt. Next thing you know, teens are like, oh, man, that seems like agape is lacking <laughs> in that situation. And in that moment, you would be right. You would be right. But what do we do next? How do we restore agape? How do we get back to that? I'm not saying we don't mess up with this, guys. We mess up. This is why we're just, Jesus set a standard, right? So we're not always going to hit that standard, but when we miss it, we want to be able to admit it and say, all right, let me get to it. Let me get to it. If I need to heal so I, so I stop hurting other people, then I'm going to heal in order to stop hurting other people. Maybe, you know, only don't do it for you. Do it for God and your ability to love other people. Right? The fight here is to get as many people to feel as the way you feel. If you, if you went, ever went to Broadway, you see the show Wicked. How did the Wicked Witch become Wicked? It's an interesting origin story, right, of the Wicked Witch. And it's because she was really hurt when she was young, right. And that hurt, hurt people hurt people, right. Archetype of this, 1 Kings 3, 16 through 28, you have two mothers. One, mo one, one mom lost a kid. Another mom had a kid. So she took the other mom's kid, right. And that's the setup for the scene when they meet Solomon. So the hurt person hurt somebody else in that situation. And that happens a lot. We got to deal with our hurts, guys. We have to deal with it for real. Deal, go there. Deal with it. Because if not, it will deal with you. 
And we're going to walk around just hurting each other left and right. Heal. What is, the, what is the pain? Let's go there. You're probably going to need help. Whatever you need. God will give you all the help you're going to need to do that. You know, I was, I, I, I've done therapy. I've done it all. I've gotten good discipling. I've gotten good Christian counseling. I've done everything. Because I'm like, I want to heal from all this junk that's messing me up. Like it's hard for me to love people when this is the thought that pops in my head. Right? Go after that healing. You know, last thing is self-righteousness, okay. When you love yourself over God, you tend to become self-righteous. You're going to experience, experience the boost to your ego through putting others down. You feel better about you when you can think of yourself as being better than other people. All right. So this is the situation. You love having dirt on other people. And uh, you often struggle to admit that you're wrong or you do any wrongdoing. They often, uh, don't, they often do not want these lesser folks, <laughs> lesser spiritual folks, to experience the grace of God or love of God. Remind you of anybody? This is Jonah. He didn't want to go preach to Nineveh because he actually didn't want them to repent and receive the grace of God. And this is also the older, the older brother with a prodigal left home and came back. And he was like, wait, how are we going to throw him a party? He didn't want him to experience the love of the Father, right? So when, you, when we struggle with self-righteousness, you, you, you walk around looking down on others as a way to make yourself feel better, right, about you. And this is why we got to declare war against these things, guys. We have to declare war because none of us want to be described by these four things. This is not the knockoff that we want to wear. We don't want to be seen from far away and say, oh, insecurity, fear, bullying, self-righteousness, right? We want people to see us. I know I do. I want people to see me from far away and be like, all right, I think I see some agape on there. You know, even if it's not 100%, there's, he's got like an agape tie. He's got like some agape shoes because that's just how hard it is. And I hope that one day as God continues to sanctify me, that someone might, and it might be by the end of my life, might look at me and say, that dude's rocking agape all the way. That dude's wearing agape love all the way. You guys want that to be the, the case for you? For somebody to look at you and be like, man, this person loves people selflessly. Imagine if that's what's said about you at the end of the day. They put their hurts aside and they love through it. They love through it. Having good boundaries is, is awesome. And there's a difference between that and building walls, right? There's a difference between boundaries and walls. All right? And we got to fight that fight. And here's, and here's how we fight it. This will be our passage wrapping up here. Luke 9, 23 through 25. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet lose or forfeit their very self? Actually, one, one more passage, guys. Hanging in there with me? This is, this is, this is prescriptive at the end. I have, I have something for you to leave with, okay? Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. Who loved me. You can say that. God loved me, right? Who loved me and gave himself up for me. All right? This, this scripture right here gives us some answers. How can we do this? says, let go, let go of desires. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. I'm letting go of me. I'm letting go of a got me. I'm letting go of that. That's number one. Number two, it talks about you got to replace it, me with something. So this scripture says, let Christ live through you. Let Christ live through you. Get rid of you. Have you move out. Have the ego move out. Move, move the Holy Spirit, Jesus in. Let him live through you. Second of all, a third of all, it says live by faith. Know that your desires are going to be taken care of. Know that the things that you, that you want to see, that a loving God sees what you want, and he's going to make sure you get exactly what you need. And, and that no might be the best thing that ever happened to you. That time that God says no might be the best thing. And fourth of all, internalize God's love for you. Because this is a recognition of, you know, the son of God who loved me you got to own that. Own the fact that God loves you. Can we all say it together? Like we'll count down from three. God loves me. Three, two, one. God loves me. you got to say that to yourself sometimes. 
God loves you. God loves you. That's, that's an amazing feeling. God loves me. Think about how your day-to-day would be changed if you walk in that truth every single day. So inspect your love today. Is it, is it the real deal or are you wrestling with a knockoff brand? Is it truly selfless? And when does self get in the way? We can win this battle together, church. This is what makes us different as a church. All right? It's our agape love. And when we do this collectively, it's one thing for an individual to do it. But imagine all of us doing it together. That light is going to shine super bright. Thank you, guys.